Welcome to the 24th Annual Capital Conference, Virtual Edition. It is our goal that each session is about an hour in length. However, we may go a little longer or we may be a little shorter. My name is David Stevens. I'm the Director of Academics for UIL. Also helping with this session is Jenny Nichols, Administrative Assistant for UIL, and she does lots of things, and she thanks for jumping in at the last minute and filling in for us today, Jenny. This session is Becoming a Celebrity. Our presenter is Linda Berry. Uh, she is the State Contest Director. She's been doing this for four or five years. Five years. Here's great. Uh, Linda, welcome, and thank you very much for being willing to share your wisdom and knowledge with our attendees in this new format of Capital Conference. Hello everybody. I'm Linda Berry, the State Contest Director, like David has said. I am Zooming to you from my study in Midlothian, Texas. This session is designed for new spelling coaches, but you coaching veterans out there can benefit as well because I'm going to be talking about the new list. To give you a little bit of background about myself, I coached this event for 20 plus years at Waxahachie High School. And during that time, I picked up some tricks of the trade, uh, if you will, from other coaches and from my students. And I'm going to be sharing those with you. Before we start with this session, I want us to take a look, first of all, at the UIL website that has a great deal of knowledge that all of us can use. So David, if you could take us to that site, we're gonna just take a quick tour. Here is the website itself under academics. Under academics to find spelling, you scroll down first of all to contest, go all the way down to the bottom to spelling and vocabulary. You click on that, and then you have the spelling page. Over there to the right, you see my email address, which you may need from time to time. But the most important thing I'd call your attention to is the list of new words. I want all of us to take a look at where you can find that. Let's click on that, David. For those of you that are new, what you'll see here is, a, is an alphabetical list of 1,500 words. Some of the words, we get down to it, some of the words, as you can see, have dots beside them. The words with dots are the vocabulary words. There are 350 of them marked with dots throughout this document. Those are for vocabulary study only. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Another thing I'd call your attention to on this website is the place where you can go for uh, additional resources. David, if you could show us where to get to that. It's under resources. You scroll down to the words additional resources and there is an alphabetical listing of all of the items you can purchase to enhance your study this year. Here they all are, I think, so. I don't know that they're all divided by spelling, but there's several spelling ancillaries you can purchase. Now, let's take a look at this uh, presentation now. We're gonna begin at the beginning. How in the world did this whole idea of spelling get started? Next. Man, as you know, is separated from all other animals by his ability to communicate across time and space. This ability is made possible only by written language. Communication in writing is made possible by man's agreement on the symbols that he uses. Next, that agreed upon sequence is called spelling. Now, why is spelling important? Those of you who are English teachers will agree with this next slide. When our spelling is perfect, it's invisible. 
but when it's flawed, it prompts strong negative associations. I'm sure many of you out there, as I was, are English teachers. You know how frustrating it is when you're grading an essay and you have to stop and start and stop and start because of misspelled words. Absolutely, there are strong negative associations with those. But those papers where we can read quickly and easily and it's very easy to understand, those are the papers that make us smile and get us good grades. How about this quote from Thomas Jefferson written in a letter to his daughter? Take care that you never spell a word wrong. Always before you write a word, consider how it's spelled. And if you don't remember, turn to a dictionary. It produces great praise to a lady or a gentleman to spell well. Next. Spelling counts. Spelling is just not a tedious exercise found in a fourth grade classroom. Spelling is one of the outward and visible marks of a disciplined mind. Why so much vocabulary? Next. Vocabulary is the best single indicator of intellectual ability and an accurate predictor of success in school. Next, to put it simply, spelling and vocabulary are important. Correctly spelled words coupled with precise and compelling diction are two of the most important aspects of effective communication. And that is why the spelling and vocabulary contest is important in fostering confident usage of words as well as success on SAT. Now, let's go to the word power that we took a look at a minute ago. You've seen that the new words are already online. You know how to go to it, you know how to see them. Uh, we're going to talk about now the, the division of the test. So let's go to how this test is divided. The test is divided into three parts. Part one is both proofreading and vocabulary. Part two, go back a little bit, David, there you go. Part two is spelling from dictation. And then part three is a tiebreaker. Now, let's talk about each of these parts. Let's talk about part one, proofreading. Next slide. This part of the test is worth 15 points and it requires that contestants giving, given 15 sets of five, five word list, recognize the one word in the list that is misspelled, then they need to spell it correctly. Most, but not all of the words from this section of the test are from word power, up to 20%. That means a maximum of three words on this section can be from other sources other than word power. Proofreading is, is questions one through 15 and it's, uh, okay, we're still on proofreading. Each question is worth one point. Now let's go to the second part of part one which is vocabulary. Do you remember when we talked about the dotted words in word power? These 350 words are the only words that can be tested in vocabulary. In my opinion, this is the easiest part of the test. There are no outside words. There are no misspelled words. There are no surprises whatsoever. Only words noted and only definitions and origins given in the dictionary can be tested. Just like in proofreading, there are 15 questions. The questions are in multiple choice format and they test your ability to recognize word origins and meanings. Next slide. 
The next part of the test, part two, is uh, spelling from dictation. This is the biggest part of the test. There, there will be 70 called out words pronounced at a rate of four words per minute. In other words, one word for every 15 seconds and a definition, not all the definitions, but a definition will be given for every word. Let's go to the tiebreaker. Tiebreaker is part three. There are 20 called out words in the tiebreaker. Again, they're pronounced at four words per minute with a definition given for all the words. With the exception of the state meet, this part is scored only in case of ties and then only those involved in the tie are scored. So now let's talk about the sources of words. A minimum of 80% of the test words for questions one through 15 of part one and all of parts two and three come from the word power list that we referenced earlier on in the presentation. Up to 20% of the test can come from outside sources. I can't tell you how many emails I've received from students over the years telling, asking me to please tell them where I get my outside words. Well, here's my answer. They can come from common usage. Words you might see, uh, see in the news. Words that you might find in the back of your textbook glossaries. Anything you might hear on the news or words that are associated with current events. Words that are comprised of roots, prefixes, and suffixes. And then generally, words of interest. Let's go to this next slide. How do you prepare for these outside words? Of course, you understand roots and their affixes, but my best advice to students is to read wisely and pay attention to words you've never seen before. Uh, on the summer worksheet that I've given for you all, I've given you some places to go to subscribe to word list, but here are some to reference here. There are places where you can go to find list of SAT words for college vocabulary. There is a source called quizlet.com uh, that has a list of college board top 100 SAT ACT vocabulary words. There's majortest.com. And then there's a really good list of 5,000 words that can be found at freevocabulary.com. Believe it or not, there's some really good vocabulary tests you can take on Facebook. Then another source that I like is you can sign up for word of the day with dictionary.com. Now let's go to some of the outside words from last year's test. Here they are. Wonder how many of your students could spell these. The first one is muesli. How did I come up with that word? I spotted it in the cereal aisle when I was shopping. Flocks, I saw. This was, on this, this was on last year's state test, by the way. I saw it when I was in the nursery, when the garden nursery, in the garden nursery. <coughs> Dungeness crab, I saw on a menu. I thought it was an interesting word. And the word crew, I heard and saw in reference to the Mardi Gras celebration, because a crew is a group of people participating in a Mardi Gras parade. I suggest that when you find an interesting word, write it down, then check the dictionary to see if you can find it. If you can't find it in the dictionary, it is ineligible. Our only dictionary, the only official source for this contest is the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, fifth edition, 50th anniversary printing. It's got to have those words on it, 50th anniversary printing. It was published in 2018. All the contest words, 
every single one of them are in this dictionary. Please note, not a, there's a paperback edition is not an acceptable source, neither is an online dictionary. I don't know how many of you can see me, but this is the only dictionary that you can use. You see it's got this 50 years of excellence on it. This is the only official dictionary for this contest. Now, in case of, in case of an error on word power, there is a place on the spelling page that we've already referenced that uh, will, anytime there, if there is an error, that's where it's going to be found. But one other comment I'd make about the dictionary, if you'd go back one slide, David, to our dictionary slide. Because I, like all of you, have been glued to the TV these last four months, looking for any news about this coronavirus, I've picked up some new words that I thought about putting on next year's test. I wondered if any student would know that coronavirus is one word. I wondered if anybody would know how to spell hydroxychloroquine, which was a suggested drug to treat COVID-19, or what about remdesivir? I checked the dictionary, none of those words are in this dictionary. Therefore, you can be assured that they will never be on this test. Another interesting word was from the National Spelling Bee. The winning word for that National Spelling Bee a couple of years ago was koinonia, which means Christian fellowship. I like that word. It is not in this dictionary. Therefore, it will never be on the test. Okay, let's go to the slide that says using language skills to build st strength in spelling. Let's talk about the ideas of phonics, pronunciation, and spelling. Go to the next slide. We're gonna talk about these things. I'll get my computer to work here. We're gonna talk about what pure vowels are. We're gonna talk about diphthongs, rules for using long and short vowels, pure consonants and consonant blends, and then a little thing called sound coloring. Let's begin. Go to this next slide. How do you spell a really long word? You do it the same way you did it when you were in elementary school. You sound it out. Let's take a look at this famous words from Mary Poppins, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. And by the way, that word is not in the dictionary. It will never be on a UIL test. But if you were asked to spell it, you wouldn't necessarily divide it into syllables. You would divide it into what I call chunks. And when you divide it into smaller pieces, the longer word is easier to spell. We'll return to this word in a little while, but for now, I want us to practice this concept with a new list word. Y'all have your pencils ready? I want you to spell lymphangiography. Lymphangiography, which means the examination of lymph nodes following injection of radio opaque substance. Can you spell lymphangiography. I'm going to give you a second or two and then we'll see if you get it right. Here it is. You divide that word into chunks. Lymph, we know what a, we, we can probably all spell lymph. The root angio deals with blood vessels and graphy means a field of study. You put those pieces together, you've got lymphangiography. Now, let's talk about pronunciation. Believe it or not, spelling in the history of the world is a very recent language skill. We all know that before there was a written form of language, there were 
oral words. Or, that's the only way knowledge was transmitted was orally. However, the invention of the printing press in the 15th century made it necessary to come to an agreement on how to present words in writing. Let's go to the next slide. In languages like Latin and Spanish, there is a direct correspondence between sound and symbol. Each sound is represented by a specific symbol. In other languages, including English, a speech sound may be represented by several symbols, and one symbol may represent several sounds, depending on the letters around it. Let's look at this next slide. Those of you that have been in my presentations before have seen this slide. I wonder how many of you can pronounce that word. Let's look at the, let's look at the answer. That word is pronounced fish. Fish. How so? Well, the f in the, the, the GH sound is just like cough. Cough ends in a GH, it makes that f sound. The I in fish can sometimes be written with an O, as in women. The sh sound that ends the word can be spelled with a T-I, as in nation. That is why this language is one of the hardest on earth to learn, okay? Let's take a look at another word. Mercedes, what do you notice about the vowels in this one word? They're all the same, aren't they? But all three of those vowels are pronounced differently. Let's look and see how. The first mer is an er sound, mer. The second e sound is pronounced long a. Mercedes. That third E sound is pronounced with a long E. Same symbol, same letter, three different pronunciations. Let's look at one funny one. I'm not going to read all of this for you. This is thanks to Oscar Wilde. Did you know you could spell potato? Like that, look, that awful word at the bottom of that slide. Crazy, isn't it? That's English for us. <laughs> All right, let's talk about something else that's troublesome in spelling uh, in English. It's the schwa, the little schwa sound. This is the most common sound we make in the English language, and it is represented in the dictionary by an upside down E. The schwa falls only on unstressed syllables. Any vowel can make the uh sound, and so can a y. Sometimes the schwa can end up in words where vowels fear to tread, like in rhythm. There's not a vowel there. And the next slide. And only in the English language can a single sound be so versatile. Did you know that there are no spelling contests in other languages, only in English? In Romance languages like French and Spanish, vowels are predictable. Look at the word banana. In Spanish, those three A's in banana are all pronounced the same. It would be banana. But in English, because the stress falls on the middle, the middle syllable, the first and the last syllables are unstressed, and they are schwa's, banana is the way we would pronounce it. Next slide. And because English absorbs words from every language, words with obvious spellings in their native tongues can be mysterious to us, for sure. Let's go back and take a look at the schwa in our supercalifragilistic word. Look at how many schwas you see there. The first schwa, I don't know what happened to that, slide there. The first schwa is an E. It's the, it, the schwa is the E. The second schwa is the I in supercali. 
the next schwa, the third schwa in that word is another I. The fourth schwa is an I. But look at the final schwa in docious. It is the triphthong I-O-U. So that little symbol is very versatile in English. Now, let's look at how many times we see schwa's in some of our words. And by the way, these are not words from this year's list. Let's just take a look, say, at the last word in this list, pachydermatous. You see the two schwa's there at the end. That first schwa is really spelled with an A. That last schwa is spelled with the diphthong O-U. Again, schwa's are, they permeate all of our vocabulary words. And part of learning how to spell these words is to know which letter to use when you hear that schwa. All right, let's talk about consonant blends. Some consonant blends, for example, the ones you see listed on this slide, have different sounds that are, that they're blended sounds that are different from that of the letters when pronounced differently. Diphthongs are the same way. Sometimes separating these sounds into their component parts uh, and exaggerating the sound helps in spelling. Let's take a look at this little idea. I got this idea from a friend, and this is a little strategy your students might use in learning how to spell words ending with a troublesome sound. Let's look at the two words, precious, contentious. They both end in shus. Sometimes when you hear shush, you don't know, is that first letter a T? Is that first letter a C? What you can do is color. Color the sounds. For instance, if you colored precious, you would color it pre-see-us. Telling your brain that precious the sh starts with a C. Contentious, you would color it by writing contentious. Telling your brain that the first letter of the sh sound is a T. Now keep in mind, this is not for writing answers on the vocabulary test. This is reminding your brain about what letter comes first. All right, let's look at two words on this year's list. The words are fugacious and seditious. I want us to color these words. I want you to take a few minutes and think, if you were teaching this to your students, how you would color these two words. I'm gonna give you a couple of seconds to think about what you would tell them to write or teach them to write. Okay, here are the answers. Fugacious. You want to advance the slide, David? Fugacious would be, would be written fugacious. Telling your brain that the first letter of that sh sound is a C. Seditious or sed sed seditious would be seditious. Telling your brain that first letter is a T. This is a strategy that may be helpful to some of your students. All right, let's talk about some troublesome items that crop up on this spelling test. Compound words. Words that have non-alphabetical marks. Words that have alternate spellings. Words that have capitalization issues. Words that have to be capitalized. Words with optional capitalization. Words where the definition informs the capitalization. Words that have a capital letter in the center of it. And then words, or entries really, with both capital and lowercase letters. Here's some examples from this year's list. Here are a few of them. Tetralogy of Fallot, it's got three words. Burnt Sienna, Joie de Vivre, Rube Alcali, 
primus inter pares. Those are just a sampling of two and three word test items. Then you've got a few, here are just a sampling of words that have non-alphabetical elements. And I wanna comment on those. Those non-alphabetic elements are just as important in this contest as the letters themselves. They must all be accurately placed. For instance, you see bleary-eyed, has got a hyphen in it. Creme brulee has the grave accent in creme. It's got the circumflex over the U in brulee, and then it's got the acu accent over the first E in brulee. El Nino has a tilde. Sjogren's syndrome has got the umlaut as well as an apostrophe. I'm going to add additional slides to about non-alphabetical accents on my student activities conference webinar, so stay tuned for those additional slides later on. Now, what about words with alternate spellings? Here are a few of them from this year's list. Aneurysm. It can be spelled either way. Either answer would be acceptable. How about Calpac? Three different right answers. Again, either answer would be acceptable. Two different ways to write forswear, umiak, riata, veranda. Any way you spell it of these two choices would be acceptable. We believe that all alternate spellings are disclosed in word power. However, the ultimate source is, again, our American Heritage Dictionary, 5th edition, 50th anniversary printing. All right, what about compound items? My students had problems with compound items uh, because they can be written three different ways, can't they? They can either be written as one word or two words or hyphenated. I think it would be a good idea to have your students create families of these three different compounds. Here's some on our list. After effect is written as one word. If you were to write it as two or you hyphenated it, it would be considered wrong. It has to be written as one word. Borderland, gridlock, honeycomb, the same thing. Here are some items on our list that have to be written as two separate words. Banana Republic, Chop Suey, fifth column. Then we have some compound items that must be hyphenated, like bleary-eyed, ego-tripped, paper thin. Again, there are many more items like this on your word list. All right, what about words that have to be capitalized? Here are a few of them. They're all proper nouns, aren't they? Chablis, Lano Estacado, Macedonia, and Tolkien. They must be capitalized. Here are a handful of words where capitalization is optional. In other words, it wouldn't matter what definition is given, you could still either write it lowercase or uppercase. Godforsaken and Torah are a couple of them. Here are another two where the capitalization depends on whatever definition is given. The word guinea. Before you could spell the word guinea, you would have to listen to the definition. If the definition to this word were a gold coin, you would write it with a lowercase g. However, if the definition were a region in Africa, it would have to be capitalized. The same is true with cayuse. Cayuse can be a little horse, or it can be a Native American. The definition would inform the capitalization. How about capitalization in the middle of a word? You, like neo-Nazi, that capital N is in the middle of that entry. Off-Broadway, the same thing. You've got a capital letter in the middle of an entry. Then you've got some words or some entries really that have both upper and lower case letters as in Addison's disease and Dresden, China. Now, let's talk about that notion, we've already referenced it, about the importance of roots, uh, history, and spelling. Let's look at how we create words from roots, prefixes, and suffixes. Here is one 
suffix that mean like in telly telly means distant i guess it's really a prefix uh metrics deals with measurement phony deals with sound graphy deals with writing and vision deals with viewing look at how many new words were created from these pieces these are actually more 19th and 20th century words than 21st century words but this is the way we create words we take the old roots prefixes and suffixes and put them together let's take a look now at just a, a list of some roots and affixes just glance over those for a second and ask yourself are you familiar with all of them did you already know these i'll give you a second to look over them i won't read them to you how about this next group of letters or next group of roots do you know those Keep in mind, that this is only a sampling of the roots, prefixes, and suffixes that there are. There are many, many more. Uh, and if you want to know all of them, you can Google root words for more. I want us to practice now. Let's look at this next slide and take a look at four new words on this year's list. Agraphia, exurbia, monogenist, and polyphony. I want you to think a minute. What do you know about the roots, prefixes, and suffixes of these words that would inform the meaning of the word? Agraphia, if you pull it apart, you would notice the prefix a literally means no or none. The root graph means to write. So if you put those two together, it, mean, it literally means that you can't write, or rather, the inability to write. If you look at exurbia, X, the prefix X means no or not. Herb deals with a city. So if you put that information together, exurbia literally means someplace outside of the city. Monogenist, it's got three pieces. It's got a good prefix, root, and suffix. Mono, the prefix, means one. The root gen means woman. The suffix ist means one who. And if you put those pieces together, it's one who has one woman or one who has one wife. That is literally the definition of that word. This last word, polyphony, you know that poly, the prefix poly means many, phony means sound. You put that together, you realize that polyphony means music, with more than one sound or more than really actually more than two sounds many sounds that's the importance of just the beginning of knowing the importance of roots prefixes and suffixes take a look at one more slide dealing with this subject a word that has often appeared on uil test is the one listed at the bottom an otorhinolaryngologist if you put those pieces together, you can see how that word was created. Odo means ear, rhino deals with your nose, larynx deals with your throat, and an ologist is one who studies. You put those pieces together, you can know the meaning of that word. Okay, next slide. As you study the word power list, especially looking at those vocabulary words, it wouldn't hurt to make list of the root words, prefixes, and suffixes you can find. That way you can learn the pieces once and you'll have them every time you need them, uh, long past high school and college, but also especially as you prepare for the SAT. Now, let's go to some basic spelling rules. 
this one has often been a problem for students in the past. What do you do when you add a suffix to a word ending in a silent E? Here's the rule. Before adding a suffix beginning with a vowel or a Y to a word ending in a silent E, the rule is you drop the silent E. There are some exceptions and we'll talk about those in a bit. Like the word amaze. If we added the suffix ed or ing to this word, you drop that silent e. Amaze to adding ing turns into amazing without the silent e. The same is true with nerve. Nerve ends in a silent e. We're adding a suffix that begins with an o. We drop that silent e and we have nervous. There are exceptions to this rule. Words ending in a soft G sound, like the J sound. You don't drop that silent E, like the word change. If you were writing the word changeable, you would not drop the silent E. The same is true with the word courage. Because it ends in that soft G sound, you don't drop the silent E when you write courageous. Now, let's look at some of these words. These words are not list words, but it's the same rule, and I think it's worth talking about. Contrive, again, it ends in a silent E. We're adding a suffix that begins with a vowel. We drop the E, the silent E, and we glue the two pieces together to make contrivance. The same is true with perceivable. We drop the silent E before attaching the suffix able, and we have perceivable. The same is true with suable. We drop that silent E and add the suffix able to make suable, but chargeable, notice it, it ends in the j sound, that soft g sound. So we keep that silent E before we attach the suffix. All right, what do we do with words ending in a consonant? There's a, there's a pretty good rule for this problem. In words of more than one syllable, you double the final consonant. When the word ends with one consonant, it's preceded by one vowel, and when the word is accented on the last syllable, like this word, begin. Look at the word begin. It ends in a consonant. There is a vowel right in front of it. The accent is on that final syllable. When those things are in place and you need to add a suffix, you double that consonant. That's the way you form the word beginning. The same is true with permit. Permit turns into permitting, a double T. You double that final consonant. The same is true with referring. You double that R in referring. Please note that in the new words formed with suffixes, the accent, the stress, stays on the same syllable. But what happens when the accent moves? Let's go to the next slide. A word that was on a, a test not long ago was noncommittal. And I wanted to see if students would know that rule. This is the way you write non-committal. It follows the rule. Commit, if you look at that root commit, it ends in a consonant. It's followed by a vowel. The accent is on that last syllable. Because of all of those things in place, you double that final consonant. Uh-oh, there, there are exceptions to, the, uh, to this rule. Look at the word deferment. Deferment follows all of the rules, but there is no double letter. It is an exception. Forgettable, it follows the rule. Okay, clearly, this idea is not a hard and fast rule. But what happens, as we were talking about earlier, when the accent moves from the last syllable to the first syllable? Look at these words. Refer, we know what the verb refer is, but if we're turning it into the noun reference, the accent changes. When the accent changes, there is no doubling of consonants at the end. The same is true with 
conference and preference. The accent changes when you're turning verbs into nouns that way. Okay? When adding a prefix to a word, don't change the spelling of the base word. Even though the prefix might create a double letter and it looks funny, keep both letters. Like if we were writing the word irregular, you would add the prefix ear to regular, it creates double letters, so be it. Keep the two double letters. Ill plus logical, keep the double letters. How about misspell? This word is misspelled, ironically, so often. And by the by, misspell is on this year's list, so take note of that. What about when you add the suffix ness to a word ending in an N? Keep the double letters. It doesn't matter if it looks funny, keep the double letters, as you see in suddenness and thinness. One of the words that I put on a regional test recently was underrepresent. I wanted to see if students would know what to do with that word. I wanted to know whether they know to write it as one word, not as two words and not hyphenated. And I wanted to make sure that they recognize the rule that when you attach a prefix to a word, a prefix ending, ending in a letter to the same, to the same uh, letter, the same letter at the beginning of the word, you'd keep both letters. Another word I put on a test a number of years ago was the word dumbbell. I wanted to see, even though the word looks funny, if, the, if students would know that you keep both Bs. Dumb, D-U-M-B, B-E-L-L. Now, I want us to take a look at, oops, you're ahead, David. <laughs> uh, at three words that are on this year's list. The words are overreach, dissemblance, and wantonness. Can you spell those? And do these words follow the rule? Overreach, dissemblance, and wantonness. All right, let's, let's show the answers. As you see, there are a number of words on this list that do exactly that. If adding a prefix uh, to a word and it makes a double letter, keep the double letters. You see it in overreach, you see it in dissemblance, you see it in wantonness. Now let's go to our old favorite, what to do with I before E. This caused many heartaches during spelling sessions with my students. How, have you ever seen this slide before? I before E, except when you run a feisty heist on a weird beige foreign neighbor. Ha ha. <laughs> all right, let's look at this rule and kind of pull it apart. We all remember the rule we learned in elementary school, I before E, except after C or sounded long A and it works for the most part. As you see in these words, I before E, you see it in thief, relieve, grieve, niece, and field. What about when it comes after C? You switch the letters if it comes after the sound C, or make the letter C, as in conceit, perceive, sealing, and receipt. But if that E-I or I-E makes a long A sound, it is spelled E-I, as in skein, and vain, and faint, the fencing move. Yes, there are exceptions to the rules. Many exceptions to the rules, I would say. Here are some of them that you may know how to spell. Either weird, seize, and leisure. I want us to take a few minutes, or just take a second, and before you turn, before you advance the slide, David, I want to see how many of you can spell four new list words. Those words are besiegement, inveigle, receivership, 
and counterfeit. I'll say them again. Besiegement, inveigle, receivership, and counterfeit. Let's see if these rules apply. Here, are the, here they are. Besiegement follows the rule. Yay. Inveigle also follows the rule because that EI makes a long A sound. Receivership also follows the rule because those letters come after the letter C. But here's our friend counterfeit. It is an exception to the rule. I'll mention this later on, but I strongly urge your students, and I've, I've referenced this in the worksheet I've prepared for them, I would have them go through the, the list and write down all of the words that are spelled E, that have the E-I in them. I will say that approximately around 80% of these words will be spelled I-E, but it's that 20% that causes you problems. I would go through this whole list, find words that are spelled with that E-I and write them down and learn them. Okay? Let's talk about the rule for using IBLES. My students tr had trouble with this. Here's a nice rule for this. If the root is not a complete word, you add the suffix I-B-L-E to it. Like in the word visible, horrible, terrible, possible, edible. Vis, for instance, is not a complete word. Therefore, you add I-B-L-E to it. However, if the root is a complete word, you add A-B-L-E to it. Like in fashionable, laughable, suitable, comfortable. Fashion, laugh, suit, comfort are all words. So you add A-B-L-E to them. If the root is a complete word ending in a silent E, you drop that E and add A-B-L-E, like you see in advisable, desirable, valuable, and debatable. Once again, unfortunately, <laughs> there are exceptions to the rules, like in the word contemptible. Contemptible is spelled with an I-B-L-E, even though contempt is a full word. The same is true with digestible, flexible, responsible, irritable, and inevitable. They are exceptions to the rules. Now, I will say to you that on last year's district, regional, and state test, there are multiples of these words on the test. That's why it's really important to know how to spell them. Again, I would strongly suggest to your spellers that they make a list of all the IBLE words, all the ABLE words, and learn them. A recent regional word was compensable, and I wanted to see if students would know how to spell it. Compensable, unfortunately, is an exception to the rule. Compense is not a word. However, the correct suffix is an A-B-L-E. Let's take a look at three words from next year's list. And I want you to think for a minute how you spell them and if the rules apply. The words are adjustable, inexpressible. Oh, David's already put it up there. Vincible and compatible. These are on this year's list. You see that adjustable follows the rule. You add A-B-L-E to it because adjust is a complete word. Inexpressible is an exception to the, to the rule. Express, the root express is a complete word. It should have ended in A-B-L-E. Don't know why it doesn't. Vincible follows the rule. Vince, the root vince is not a complete word. So I-B-L-E is the correct suffix. Compatible follows the rule. The root compat is not a word. To add the suffix I-B-L-E is correct. All right, 
let's talk about when to use the suffix seed. Only one English word ends in this suffix, S-E-D-E, -E. only one, supersede. And it's often seen on UIL tests. I remember the very first time I saw it on a word list, I was positive it was misspelled. There are three words that end in C-E-E-D, only three, exceed, proceed, and succeed. All other verbs ending in the seed sound are spelled with this ending, C-E-D-E, -E, as in concede, proceed, recede, and secede. And by the way, concede is on this year's list, so take notice. <laughs> All right, how to organize for learning. I've, I've mentioned several times in this presentation the importance of creating word families. Right now, I want to take a minute and talk about the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is what this next school year is going to look like. We know without a doubt, it's not going to look like it did last year. It's, not, it's going to be very different from normal. And as a result, you may have limited in-person time to spend with your students. I strongly recommend you're preparing them to learn the words on their own and begin as soon as possible. That's why I've created that worksheet for you. Now, for those of you who, in looking at that worksheet, say to yourself, well, there is an ancillary that's already broken these words down for them. They don't need to write them, but I say to you that there is something to be said for actually writing words down. I think there's learning to be had when students take the time to literally write words. All right, moving along. Here's some word families that you might have students create. And I may have, some of these I've already added to your worksheet. Words with common or similar characteristics, like perhaps words that end in ibble and noble. Word forms. Words with those non-alphabetical elements, like the diacritical marks. Words with alternate spellings. Words that have got issues with capitalization. Words with specific roots and prefixes and suffixes and words used in context. Here's some other word families. You could use things like trademarks as a word family, medical terms, legal, food, political, musical terms, words that come from the same language, and we've already mentioned words with non-alphabetical elements. Now let's talk a minute about those non-alphabetical elements. Words which have come to us from other languages may have non-alphabetical elements which designate pronunciations like the tilde, the circumflex, the Karen, the sedilla, the diuresis or umlaut, the aq and grave accents. I've mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning again. These are pronunciation features and must be used correctly in spelling the word correctly. More about this, these kinds of symbols in the student activity conference. Now, let's look at some words on last year's test that had these non-alphabetical symbols. The first one you see is Tet Besh. You wanna advance it, David? First one is Tet Besh. You see that word has two circumflexes. The next word is Sub-Saharan. It's got one of those funky capital letters in the middle of it, and it's got a, a hyphen. Feance has got the umlaut, B'nai B'rith was an outside word, I think on the state test, it's got the apostrophes in it. Champs-Élysées has got two accus, and then Vipers Bugloss has got the apostrophe in it. Again, all of these symbols are just as important as the letters. Now, let's talk about ways to study and prepare, and again, 
they're probably, this is probably going to be more important next year than ever before. First of all, how to begin. You, for you as a coach, you've got to have fun and you've got to be creative. If you are a coach that's really not much into words, then this may be a, a rather grueling year for you. To be a good UIL spelling coach, you've got to love words and you've got to be excited about this contest. If you are, that excitement will filter down to your students. Now, I want all of you too to emphasize the team aspect of UIL and encourage teammates to support one another and to help one another learn words. It goes without saying, this is a contest that, that takes a lot of time and it's going to take some time to produce winners. All right, next slide. One thing you can do, you can either have students create them on their own or you can purchase them, is make flashcards. I had one state speller a number of years ago that even though I gave her pre-made flashcards, she set them aside and made her own because she knew the importance of writing the word herself. I used to tell this to my students, the more of your five senses you employ in learning, the easier it is for information to fall into your long-term memory. Now take, for example, writing the words. When you are hand writing the words, you say the word, you look at the word, you are touching the pencil as you are writing the words. You are employing three of your five senses. That helps you in learning these words. Some of the things you can put on this three by five card, it can be anything you want to help you learn the word. You can write its pronunciation, you can write its definition, you can write its sound color, whatever it is you want to, to facilitate learning. And again, as I've said before, these flashcards are already pre-made and offered for sale from one of our vendors. Uh, another thing you can do is establish a context when you are learning the words. After you've written the word, its definition, its derivation, and pronunciation on a card, you can also write or speak a sentence that uses the word in its proper context. I know this next step sounds laborious, but it works. This is what I suggest you, to, you tell your students to do in learning these words you say the word out loud, you spell the word out loud, you say the word again, then you say the word again, you write the word, then you say the word again. Yes, it's labor intensive, but it will pay dividends. All right. Other things you can do that we've talked about before, different kinds of practice sets. It's a good idea to have a study buddy. That may be really great, especially this school year when you and perhaps your team, your kid's team can Zoom with one another and, spe and practice spelling. Uh, another thing to do is when you are reading your classwork material or any kind of reading, when you come up on a new word, stop and look it up. If you need to hear these words pronounced, you can go to this source, www.mydictionary.com. Really quickly, I'm going to talk about some fun ways to study that might be beneficial. How about this one? Peppermint stimulates the brain and helps with concentration. When studying for a certain subject, pretend you have to teach it, then you'll pay more attention. I found that as a teacher it is absolutely true. This next one, I used this one when I graded research papers. Studying hard for 30 to 50 minutes at a time with a 10 minute break where you reward yourself with something is the most effective way to do long-term studying or work. 
The next one, oh, don't you love this one? Eating chocolate while studying. Literally, science has proven will help the brain retain information. I've referenced this one before. Writing something out is equivalent to reading it seven times. I, I think this must be why I like blue ink so much. You're more likely to remember something you write in blue ink as opposed to black ink. Interesting. Another thing you can do that my state spellers did, they, they created this, is they practiced word wars with one another. They took the list words and they hurled insults. Uh, at this point, it was over email to each other. And here's a real quick little excerpt of their word wars. Both these girls were state spellers. Kendall was, a, was a one first place. Lydia says to her, you are such a tattered amalian. Go rusticate. Well, Kendall, new to these words, had to look those two words up before she could find an equally uh, ugly expression to hurl back at Lydia. I hope you get the screaming memes, you varlet. And Lydia responds, you Weisenheimer, you think you're a whiz bang walk, but Vox Populi says you're really just a boondoggling Walter Mitty. Kendall responds by, you are gauche and lack erudition. Go fall off a cuesta and catch kyphosis. And Lydia responds, your floor you is over. I hope you become an old femme covert making feijoada and falafel. This little trick is a fun way to practice long distance learning. Uh, encourage your students to battle one another with words. You also can do the very opposite. You can exaggerate compliments with using list words with one another. Another fun thing that you can do as a possible get together is have a word banquet. For such a party next year, kids could bring stuff like chop suey, haggis, haggis, Delmonico steak, wiener schnitzel, or salami. I would, however, tell your students to hold off on the Chablis. I don't know that your administration would be pleased with having them bring that word. Now, word, uh, a word of caution. For those students who will get a parent or a sibling to call out words to them, it's really important that whoever calls words out knows how to pronounce them. We in Texas tend to mispronounce common words. Like that first word, different. Different has three syllables, but we in Texas drop that middle syllable and we sometimes transpose some letters. Many times this word will come out as different. Uh, another word is surprise. It's actually pronounced surprise, but in Texas we call, we say surprise. Going on a little bit further about transposing letters, this is my favorite one. It's the, it's the word realtor. I can't tell you how many of my educated friends pronounce this word realtor. Again, have whoever calls out words to your students to be one that knows how to pronounce them. All right, really quickly as we finish this presentation, I do wanna have time for questions. Tell your students the importance of writing legibly. I would go so far as to tell you coaches, if you've got a crackerjack speller who has terrible handwriting, that you find another speller. That's terrible to say that but handwriting is very important to this contest. Uh, if graders can't tell what a letter is, the rule is they isolate that letter from the rest of the word by placing thumbs or cards on either side of it. And if it is still unrecognizable, it's incorrect. In grading, if two or three grader, two or three great, two of the three graders must agree that the letter is correct or it's a missed word. Uh, it's a, always a good idea to never use capital letters. Very quickly, I would tell your contestants this. I used to tell my students this. It doesn't matter whether you can read your handwriting. 
It doesn't matter whether your coach can read your handwriting. What matters is if a complete stranger can read your handwriting. It's very important. Lastly, at the end of the test, I would, I would certainly tell my students to take advantage of the verification period. The verification period is 15 minutes that occurs between the scoring of the papers and the announcement of the final results to be sure that your score is correct. Uh, it was during the state test uh, a few years ago where we discovered the alternate spelling of ukulele, which was a fiasco, which we won't go into. Finally, uh, one more thing before we go. After having your students download next year's list, again, be sure to have them complete that summer worksheet that's attached. If they'll complete that summer worksheet, they will be way ahead of those whose first exposure to the words is in August or September. I will look forward to hearing from each of you. Best wishes for each of you as you plan for what will surely be an unprecedented school year. Really quickly, I'll ask if there are any questions. We have a couple, Linda. Okay. Um, hey, Laurie. First of all, I wanted to make sure everyone knows the worksheet Linda continues to refer to and talks about as, long, as well as this presentation and the uh, list of words can be found on that Capital Conference slash online site. I posted the link a couple of times in the chat box. So it's also in that email reminder email you received. So that's where you can go, it's under handouts and presentations. So your first question is, even though only 350 words require students to know the definition origin, do you recommend that students learn the definition origin of other words? I would say yes. I think they need to know the defin they need to have a good idea of the definition of all of those words. Yes. But especially those 350 words. Great. Another question is there a possibility the district test would be a computer program pronouncer? I have no idea. That is one I'm uh, again this this time that we're all living in is unprecedented for all of us. I wish I had a crystal ball that could say that when spring comes, this will all be a terrible memory, but I don't know. David, can you, can you address that question? Uh, we don't even know what's going to happen with our events. They're supposed to start August the 1st, so uh, <laughs> no, I have no idea what's going to happen in March yet. So our goal is to do everything as we have it on the calendar right now, as we always have. We are obviously researching um, multiple options of what's possible electronically. Is there a way we can do a lot of our contests virtually if we have to without creating a lot of work for the teacher above what you already do? And it's just going to depend on what we have to do and what we can do. So. Um, one of the things you might cover, Linda, is there a reason we don't use a recording for the word pronouncers at contests? I think the reason we don't use it is just technology. I think that uh, you always have the problem of students not being able to hear. You have a problem with batteries going bad in a tape recorder. I think there are too many, there are too many variables. And as long as we can, as long as it's possible, we need to have in-person pronunciation. Very good. Um, are there any sources you recommend to practice our off-list words? It's, I, I have listed a good number of places you can subscribe for cool vocabulary words, and it's on that worksheet. I would suggest students do that. Or just look at the shelves in the supermarket like Linda does. So. <laughs> just be, <laughs> just be, uh, be aware of, of new words. Great. Um, we can't make the kids study and then not get them to compete again. Uh, it was pretty devastating to them. We use it 
You get all the invitational meets and it works really well. That's the, according, the, according to the recording process, I guess, is what uh, Laurie's referring to there. So about recording. Um, is, there, is that a question? Yeah, it's a statement, I think. Uh, we can't make the kids study and then not get them to compete again. It was pretty devastating to them. We, and then she said, we use it at all the invitational meets. I'm assuming the uh, recording of the pronunciations, and it works very well. So yeah, those two comments, uh, I think, in together. So I got it figured I'll out now, right. I'll agree to that, and I can see there be a whole lot of invitational tests being done by computer and possibly Zoom. Uh, uh, again, I don't, I don't know if they're going to be invitational tests or not, but when I coached this event, I really liked the computer testing. Great. Yeah, that's something we'll certainly look into. And uh, I think hopefully the, uh, if we get anything out of this uh, COVID thing we're living through is how do we advance our contest to the next level that doesn't make them paper pencil and sort of ideas. So we're obviously going to look and keep looking. So our goal is to make sure we have contests this year, hopefully. Uh, a lot of thank yous and informative. The presentation was super informative. This is from a new coach. Um, very informative. As always, Ms. Barry, thank you. Appreciate the presentation. Um, and somebody said it gives consistency of pronunciation and immediate grading when you do the computer and other things. So good, good stuff. Thanks, Laurie. Good, and that's all the questions we have in the chat box so far. Unless somebody else put something up there. Uh, anything else you want to add before we stop the recording, Linda? The only thing is, is as the year proceeds, if you have any questions, you are looking at my email address. I always respond to emails, so feel free to ask me any question you'd like as, as you think of them. Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. We're going to stop the recording now.